Hello and welcome to another episode of On the Floor with Wayne and Rob. I'm Wayne Highlander, National Sales Manager for Bona Adhesives. And I'm Rob Johnson from Bona Training. Rob, all the legends are dying. Last few times uh, back, it was uh, Eddie Van Halen and Sean Connery died the other day. And now uh, Bill, Billy Joe Schaefer. You know who Billy Joe Schaefer is? Mm, why have I heard that? Oh, he was the gay. He's uh, Green Day. Oh gosh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Billy Joe Schaefer. A lot of people don't know who he is. He's a legend, but a lot of people don't know him. Um, he's a he's a singer, but not necessarily successful. I mean, like on a on a huge scale. But uh, he wrote a lot of songs for a lot of people, and he's very well respected. He's from Texas. I think he's from Texas. But uh, you've heard outlaw country, right? You've heard that expression? Yes. You can almost trace it back to him. If you look at that uh, Waylon Jennings album, Honky Tonk, uh, Heroes, uh, he wrote every song in that album or co helped co-write every song in that album. And that's where his fame came from. So he died. We're losing a lot of legends. They're dying. What Isn't songs did he write? He said he wrote some famous songs. What songs did he write? Honky Tonk Heroes. I mean, you know, mothers don't let no, mothers don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. I think is his, but don't quote me on that. I, I'd have to look that up, and I don't want to. All right. So anyhow, when I saw the legends of dime, I'm, I'm afraid to fall asleep at night, Rob. <laughs> just a, just another legend in your own mind, huh? Yeah, it's scary. You know what album I just bought, or just uh, you know, whatever they call that. You no. buy albums anymore? No, I didn't buy an album. I guess you could call I bought an album, you know, on Apple. Apple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do they call that? The Apple Library, whatever. The Apple uh, Music Store. <laughs> what is that called? <laughs> Apple, Apple Music. Apple. Okay. It, it I sounds bought, wrong, don't it? Yeah, it? yeah, I know it's called something. <laughs> iTunes, ah. idiot. iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> Both of us don't know. <laughs> oh, man. I love that freaking iTunes. I have spent thousands of dollars on that thing over the few over the last few years. And uh, the last album I just bought was Johnny Paycheck's Take This Job and Shove It. His worst song he ever sang. And his most famous. Isn't that funny? Because... Yeah. He does a song on that album that even my kids like. Everybody came over the other day for a cookout. I was playing my new music. And that song that they love, that I'd love too, is um, I'm the Only Hell My Mama Ever Raised. Yeah. That is a good song. That's a good song, but his best song of all time is Old Violin. Old Violin? Yeah. And... Um... Huh. There was another one, um, take off those satin sheets, something about satin sheets. I don't know. I can't remember the name of it. But old violin satin, was from cotton to satin? Yeah. Yeah. He's, man yeah. was into his threads. Yes. From cotton to satin. But you from know, Birmingham as, to Manhattan. He from died. A pick up to a lonely limousine. She went from cotton to satin. From Birmingham to Manhattan. What the hell are you singing? He had to follow her dreams. Uh, that's a good song. I could sing that song. You want me to keep going? Or you... No, no, I'm good. I can tell you don't want me to keep no. going with that. Um, he died penniless, you know. He 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 died dead broke. Couldn't even afford his own uh, his own funeral or anything. George There's Jones. a story that I heard when I was in Memphis. Um, he was going to tour with Johnny Cash. Or Johnny Cash wanted him to tour or do a concert with him, something like that. And they had to get him there a day early. They lied to him. Okay, they said, hey, you need to be here on the 18th. And they knew that he wouldn't be there on the 18th. But it was really the 19th. And he shows up late, and they actually held him prisoner in his hotel room. Wow. Just so he could do it. it story's great. I'm barely skimming the, the story, but I heard it in Johnny Cash's 
words, okay? Mm -hmm. We had done some of the Johnny Cash tours and stuff like that. And, oh, the story is just hysterical because he was flipping mad that they would do that. But that was the only way they knew that they could get him there and get him to do the show. But, yeah, yeah I did hear that, that uh, he didn't have much after he passed. Yep. Okay. So we are going to talk today about contracts. Why do we need them? And I'll tell you one good reason to, uh, that came to my mind right away, Rob. Um, you know, and I think probably the same, in a way, we're kind of like hairdressers. It'd be like me going to a barbershop and saying, hey, uh, here's a picture of Matthew McC McConaughey. I want to look like that. I want my head to look like this when I come out, right? You know, there could be some stuff lost in that translation, right? There has expectations all over every job we go into. And so it's important that we, uh, that we, uh, at least talk about contracts and for uh, full disclosure, a little disclaimer here, Rob and I are not attorneys. So, you know, take that into, into, uh, you know, into the equation when we talk about this. We, need <laughs> we are not attorneys. Don't even play one on TV. Did you use contracts as a contractor? I sure did, yeah. Uh, the only reason I ever started using contracts was I found out it was a way I could get good down payments rather than just asking somebody or writing it on the back of the card or anything. Uh, like I said, terrible businessman, pretty good floor guy, terrible businessman. Um, right off the bat, I'll tell you why I started really going to contracts because – I got burned a couple of times. It was during the heyday of oil soaps. And we had done a couple of recoats that went south on us because, you know, this was back in the 80s. And I had to eat those jobs. Once that finish started peeling, now I had to go in and do a whole resand on that. So after the second disaster, we started writing up contracts. And one of the ways that we wrote into our contract was, you know, I charge X number, uh, you know, I charge 250 to sand your floor and a buck to screen and coat your floor. If the screen and coat fails, I'll only charge you a dollar 75. So that way everybody, you know, who knows if it was a legal contract, it looked legal. I remember we went to an office to supply place and got it, but it, it helped. And it did help us out in a couple of jobs. So if you're well, not using contracts. Yeah. Well, in some cases, it's a state law that you have to have a contract for work for over, say, like work for over $500. It's probably changed since then, since then, but. Really? Uh, I did not know that that was yeah. a law. Like in California, it was a law. I, at the time, it was like anything, any work over $500, you need to have a contract for. Again, we're not attorneys, so. <laughs> Take that into account. Um, and also you have to have a, you know, you want to have a mechanics lien, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's part of the deal too. So, uh, you know, our contract had an, an, a, a, a place for the mechanics lien. Um, also. Um, oh, wait a minute. Let's, let's talk about that. You could do a mechanics lien on the contract. I yeah, always thought they were separate. No, ours was right on it. I mean, a, a place for them to sign. And it said, under the mechanics lien law, any contractor, subcontractor, labor, or supplier, or any other person to help improve your property, but is not paid for his work or supplies as a right to enforce a claim against your property. It's written right on there. This means that after a court hearing, your property could be sold by a court officer and the proceeds of the sale will be used to satisfy indebtedness. This can happen even if you have paid your own contractor in full. If the subcontractor, labor, or supplier remains unpaid, lien laws provide for the subcontractor to obtain the following information before this contract or proposal is valid. And then it's got the general contractor's information, the owner's information, and the lender, whoever is involved. Okay. Uh, and it puts the homeowner on notice. Like I said, they could, you know, and we've all heard the stories where. You go to get your money from the homeowner. He goes, well, I paid the contractor. I can't help you. I mean, you know, you're supposed to come out of his and, you know, you, you know how that goes. So, 
So it's, it's, I think, listen, one of the best things I ever heard from a, a lady in this industry uh, was that handshakes are great for introductions. After that, I want a contract. And I think that makes a lot of sense. So today we'll talk about some of these things. And listen, the contract I had, I got from the NWFA like 20 some odd years ago. And I think my wife added a couple things to it or whatever. But um, on this one, there's 20 different uh, uh, parts to this contract on the back. And I'm not going to read all of these 20 things. Uh, but I think we should go over a few of them. I think some of these are important and, and people, and by the way, if someone's listening to, if someone's listening to this, um, if you email me, I'll send it to you if you like, and you can use none of it, part of it, or all of it. I don't care, but email me and I'll send it to you. My email address is wayne.highlander at bona.com. It's W-A-Y-N-E dot H-I-G-H. L-A-N-D-E-R at bona.com. Um, I, I, I personally, my own, my own personal opinion is contracts are very important. There's too much money on the line. There's too much room for, uh, you know, a contract is basically a meeting of the minds. You guys are, it says that we met, we discussed this, here's the expectations, here's what I say I'm going to do, what I'm not going to do, and by the way, here's the payment schedule. Right. I mean, I have the things I have to do and there's things that you have to do and it just lays it out there. So there's no at the end of the job. Well, I thought it was going to be this. And, you know, I, 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 you know, there's too much money on the line. This is this is not. The time uh, to you know, something. This is terrible. This is not what you should be doing to our listeners. Because I'm reading through this contract and you're oh, you're everybody's best buddy. Huh? You're going to, I'll send you this contract. Let me read what he's going to send you, folks. Final payment is due upon completion unless an ultimate payment schedule has been figured out and arranged and paid to Wayne Highlander. I need the money, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you, what, the jig is up now. The jig, yeah, this was my, exactly. This is my exit plan. Because I'm for the people. Okay, I'm a people person. All yeah, right. Make sure you read through this. This is great. What's this, a California contract? Uh, well, I lived in California, but no, as I said, I got this one left from the NWFA, and then I think my wife added some stuff onto it. Okay, because well. I'm looking at the top of this contract, and it says CL, so that must have been your California license? Uh, contractor's license. Contractor's license. Yeah. Gosh, I forgot about that number. I haven't seen that number in a long time, man. Uh, four eight three three, cool. three zero. Well, don't give it out. People be using it now. <laughs> um, but on the front of the contract, it's, you know, it says proposal contract has my phone number, my license number, and it's it's four. And and by the way, it's in triplicate. And that I like that because I could send them. I, I after I wrote the, the the contract up, it's in triplicate. So the the back page I would keep in the office and I never left the office in case one of them got missing on a job site or whatever, I'd always have the original copy with a signature on it, right? Mm -hmm. We would put the other one in the mail. Now guys use email and that kind of stuff, whatever, or you can deliver it in person or whatever. Uh, or this can be probably done online, I'm sure. But um, then we'd have the architect's name, if that was the case, the job, the location, the job phone, the date of the plans, if there's plans we're working off. And then we have the scope of the work that we're going to do, okay? And then we put now we're we're proposing to furnish labor material blah 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 and it have the sum, not only the dollar amount but we would write it out also because that's another area that because that was that a five or a nine, ah it looks to me like oh you're fifty one hundred, oh you now you tell me it's fifty nine hundred is that a nine, so it has a place to write it out also like a check right like a check yeah, yeah. and then the authorized signatures and there's the other thing this is very important. This proposal may be withdrawn for uh, by us if not accepted in so many days or by a date, okay? And why, here's, why, here's why this is important. You know, we don't get every job we bid. You might be shocked by that, Rob. But, but um, we never got every job. So let's say I sent this out to somebody in July. How was your batting average for getting jobs? Ah, uh, it was pretty good. Yeah, um, I, I, that was really important to me. I, I did all the estimating for our yeah. company. And 
I wanted a healthy batting average. I mean, that's, I, I wanted that. I, mean, I was very proud of my, my batting average. I was, I was probably, and I'm not bragging, yeah. and for some guys that might be, oh, that's it's too low, but I was like eight out of every 10 estimates I got. That, I'm not bragging. My, I'm just saying that's me. No, I, I, I'm not. I know you're not bragging. My the flip side of that is that may not be a good thing. Just throwing it out there. Maybe you it don't was want good for me. Jobs. It was good for me. Okay. Okay. I, yeah. I, I get slept. It. I slept really good at night. But, like I got a great I, batting. I, I'm just saying, if we're talking about this, you know, uh, for some people, don't think you have to get them all. You don't want them all. You know what I mean? No, no, no. Don't get me wrong. No, I, I know. I was I not the cheapest guy. I was, I was actually one of the higher price guys. Yeah. Look. So, oh, you know, the ones that I wasn't getting, it was probably that I really didn't want it. Yeah. Very sensitive about this. I see. But <laughs> eight for ten, eight for ten. If I, if I was a ball player, oh, you'd be I'm in the hall. hall. Of fame. I'm in the hall, baby. You'd be a legend too. <laughs> so, so, but this is important because. Um, and I've actually had this happen before where we give a contract to somebody and two years later, you say, okay, we want to do the work now. It's $6,600. You will know it's, Oh, it's not anymore. Then. They go, no, no, we have a contract. I go, well, yeah, but read the contract. It says if it's not accepted by such and such date, it's not valid anymore. Uh, so be aware of that. And um, as I said, the mechanics lean and then the gut of it, of the contract is on the back. As, again, there's 20 different things on there. I'm not going to read them all. But I think there will be some that I think are important. One is force majeure. What that, what number is that one? Number twelve. Number twelve. The delays caused by floods, strikes, labor disputes, accidents, acts of God, or other causes beyond the reasonable control of the seller shall excuse or extend the time for performance of the contract purchaser has provided for such property damage insurance as he or she feels adequate i think that's important uh just because if things happen there's a flood or whatever and they say well he delayed the job and there's other trades involved uh you know especially you know, listen by the way i did work in california we know it's a very litigious society litigious um, and i think that's some big words here today litigious yes, sir. Well, I, I can do it if i read them What's the, uh, what's that one again? Major? Yeah. Force majeure. Yeah. Don't try to order that in a restaurant. Did you know Number what that meant or did you have to look it up? I knew what it meant. Of course you did. Uh, yeah, I mean, I knew what it That's meant. That's right. You're from all over the world. You've, you've traveled the whole world. You, of course. You know it. Force majeure. So number 13, purchaser agrees to have all work areas broom clean and ready for the floor layers and or finishers when they arrive. Purchaser also agrees to have 220 volt, 30 amp power available within 100 feet of the working area via standard electrical outlets. Uh, let's put a little bit of onus on them that um, you guys are not, you know, you're not breaking into the, the, the boxes with alligator clips and that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I think that's, we talk about that, that's important. Uh, I wanna kind of go through quickly for these. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. On number 13, having the 220, 30 amp, what if it was gas? What would you do? Would you just leave them a pigtail and say, you're going to need a electrician to hook this up? Okay. Or did you have a guy? Okay. Back in the day. I'm okay. Gonna, I'm, I'm uh, going to be honest with you. That's okay. We're I, we being learned honest. old school. That's it. Good. You know, I'm glad you we, said that. Yeah. We learned old school and we did some things we probably shouldn't have done. I know we shouldn't have done. Uh, but, but we uh, were so damn good at it, huh? Well, cracking into a box like an otter into a clam man that that was our thing right we all did it we're not supposed to oh my god the things i've learned since then yeah but in, in all seriousness you know it's a it's a different world than it is now than it was back then rather very litigious yes okay this one i like a lot what number 15 Purchaser is responsible for providing proper temperature and humidity con conditions at the job site. Purchaser is aware that wood products can be adversely affected by too little or too much humidity and hereby accepts responsibility for any damage 
occurring as a result of adverse job site conditions. Right? Let's put some of the onus back on 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 the homeowner and the the the, the builder. Okay. I'm All right. Jump down. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Um, when you said you want to do a contract show, I was like, uh, that's going to be pretty boring. But I like this contract. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. I mean, that one you just read, I'm going to send this to bum. Actually, I'm going to use this in the schools. Okay. Yeah. There's some really Good. great stuff in here specifically well, for a wood floor guy. Now, you know, I hate to give you your due, but I got to give the devil his due. This is a really good wood floor guy contract. So, Cause so many contract, I mean, the one we used was just a standard contractor, any guy, you know what I mean? Just fill in the blank type of a thing, wood roofing, whatever. This is great stuff. Well, this one was written guy. on a napkin out of Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Look at number 19. Don't okay. be mean now. I no, just no, gave I, you a pat on the back. I, I, sorry. I just gave you a pat on the back and you know, you're going to you know. saying I'm doing my contracts. And I told you I had a contract. It even had a, it was only two copies though. Okay. Well, all right. Number 19. 19. Purchaser is aware that job site temperature and moisture conditions may adverse may adversely affect wood products and therefore purchasely expressly agrees that sellers shall not be responsible for any expansion, shrinkage, cupping, buckling, or other reaction of wood to moisture or dryness without regard to the size, grade, or previous condition of the material. Sellers shall further not be held responsible for any type of insect infestation. Damn. Basically, I'm getting paid. I think okay. on there, you need to tell them this is great. I love this. Let me tell you, let me tell Somewhere you. Somewhere on here, though, I would think if a guy was going to use this now, you would have to tell them what the parameters would be for that moisture range. Well, let me. Or, let the, me you, or the relative humidity in the home. You bring a great, it's a great. Yeah, see, that was I just I, I brought you down with the, the napkin and the Dunkin' Donuts. I'm gonna bring you back up. Okay. <laughs> that's an excellent point. And that's the one thing I've always said was missing from this contract. And 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 let me tell you a little story why. I know a fantastic contractor. I mean a lights out, fantastic, many generations, great reputation. He did a floor for he did a, a the installation of a, the floors in a house for this lady. Beautiful job. Thank you very much. They look extraordinary. Okay. Here's your check. Everybody's happy. A year later, calls him up and says, Hey, these floors are buckling. You need to replace my floors. And he said, Well, she's crazy. I mean, I, I, I have measurements. I checked the measurements. I, I'm blah, blah, blah. So he went there. He had the records. I did all the testing I'm supposed to do. Went in there. The floors are, I mean, really badly cupped, right? A year later. And uh, he goes, Well, I mean, uh, when did you first start noticing this? I mean, this is this uh, this not should not have happened. I mean, you know, the, everything conditions were right. We acclimated the wood. She goes, well, when we got back, we don't live in this house. We have a house in Hawaii. This is in California, and so the, basically, this house sat unoccupied for about a year. Okay, the greenhouse effect and everything, the no moisture controls on the floor, you know, went to hell. So he's in his mind. He goes, well, hey, you got nothing on me. I mean, you know, she, supposed, she didn't do what she was supposed to do. I can't help that. So it goes to court. He goes, well, fine, let's go to court. He lost. He lost because he didn't have any language in there to, to explain to her how she needed to take care of her floor, where she needed to keep the humidity, you know, within yes, 35 yes. to 55% and all that stuff. There was right, no clause right. in there. And so you're right. And that was what was missing from this contract also. So when I heard that story, I thought, man, that's a that's pretty shocking. And the guy went into the court with all the confidence in the world, oh, and ended up oh. having to buy that floor. No, that's great. I'll tell you, this is super. And I right now, that's the only thing that I'd add to that. Just give him well, the. As the, I said, there's like 20 things on here, and I won't go through them all. I will read number 20. Would you like to read number 20? Maybe I'm no. tired of talking. 
Want me to go? All okay. right, I'll do it. Okay. I got my glasses on. I'm going to see if I can spread this out. Make it. Purchaser is aware that sanding of wood products will create fine dust in the air and purchaser has taken such precautions as he or she feels adequate to protect the surrounding area from such dust. Seller shall not be held responsible for any damage resulting from the dust, nor shall seller be responsible to clean up such dust. Now, that's having a said scary that, one. That's a scary one. Having said that, um, you know, obviously, you know, we, you know, we use dust containment, we do all these things, you know, you, you, you have these conversation, right? But look at all the electronics that are out there. Look at this, look at the price of the of TVs and computers and all that stuff. And if, if someone was to come to you and say, well, my computer doesn't work now, or whatever doesn't work. And I think it's because of the dust of you guys being on the job. Nice to be able to have something right in defense of yourself. Mm. I think and especially, this is a, you know, I'd leave that in if you're using dust containment. And then I'd mention, you know, I also, yeah, that's in there if somebody wanted to mention it, but don't worry, I'm going to drape things anyways, and I'm going to have, uh, I have dust containment, but no, you're right. You got to have something in there like that. How about number 16? Purchaser accepts responsibility for materials delivered to the job site in good order by seller or his suppliers and agrees to provide protection against theft and damage from the elements. So we dropped off 2,000 square feet at your house. It's mysteriously gone next week. All right. Well, this in the contract states that you're responsible for it, right? And because it walked off the job, there's, and again, listen, I lived in the real world. Will this, is this bulletproof? I mean, you know, anybody can do anything, right? I mean, you say they just flat out not pay you. They may not have the money to pay you or whatever. But right. I just think that, I, I say many times on this podcast, if you look at the amount of things that you have going on your side of the equation, and if you look at the amount of things going against you that can go wrong or that, you know, it can cause you not to get paid or delayed on a job, the more things you can put on your side of the equation, the better it allows you to sleep at night. I'm going to read the top of this, um, of this contract on the back page too, which is underlined and bold at the top of this. The terms and conditions outlined on this pre-printed page have been reviewed and agreed by both parties prior to signing the contract. Both parties understand and agree to be bound by each of the paragraphs here within. Okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a lot of good stuff here. It's, 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 it's designed to, to, you know, there's, like I said, there's so much on the line these days and there's, you know, especially with, with, um, you know, the litigious society that we live in nowadays. Yeah, yeah. and you know, yeah. there's, 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 there's. Um, I'm going to try and slip that in tonight when I'm talking to Pauline at dinner. The litigious society. I'm gonna. Uh, I might try to slip something into, you know. I'll slip that litigious thing. What was that other thing? Force majeure. Yeah. Majeure. I don't know if I can slip that one in, but. I'll, I'll do the litigious. Put them litigious. together for a sentence, Sentence, Rob. Try it. One whole sentence? Yeah, using them both. Boy, if you don't watch out on that force majeure thing, you could end up in a very uh, uh, litigious situation. There you go. You sound oh. like Z. Oh. Oh. oh, boy. I didn't even have to write that down as a note. Number three. Should Number arbitration... Three. Should arbitration or a lawsuit be brought by either party to enforce the terms of this contract or any dispute arising out of it, the prevailing party shall be entitled to reasonable attorney fees. And here's why that's important. And actually, this is a, there was a contractor, a general contractor in California that, uh, you know, the courts are so booked up in San Francisco, they're so far behind that he was notorious for not paying. Now, he, he would tell you, and he's going to pay you, but it's going to be a year before you get your money. And you can sue them if you want, but it takes that long before it goes through court, right? The way he's right. hanging on your money. So, you know, at least this way, if, it, if somebody sues you for something that's completely ridiculous, whatever, you know what I mean? And you have to spend, you're putting out the, all this money to go to court. At least there's a provision here for that. He would have to pay your fee, he or she. If they were, if you were right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 
So again, I won't go through all of these. You can email me again. I'll happily happily send this to you if you like. Um, and again, uh, you know, folks, I would definitely, I would definitely take a look at this. If you um, if you're just using like a standard operator contract that you get down at uh, Staples or something, I would definitely take a look at this that uh, Wayne's offering up to you because there's some. I'm just kind of reading through it. There's some great stuff. This is really, and you said you got this from the NWFA or parts of this years from the ago, NWFA? I mean like 25 years ago or more. Yeah, this is really something. And we made some changes to it. But, um, and again, I'm going to say for the third time, Rob and I are not attorneys. Um, you, you, you know, you use your own discretion. I'm telling you, I'm starting to feel like one reading this though. That force majeure stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You're telling me after three tries. <laughs> hey, did you ever end up joining that gym? I did. Um, despite my disdain for that guy that said I qualify for silver sneakers, I did. I took the discount. I wasn't too proud for that, and I did join. Are you lifting? Uh, no, I'm not lifting right now. I, I right now I'm, I'm doing the treadmill. Um, I'm not lifting, and I don't know if I ever will because. Uh, it's a long road back to the top uh, lifting. So I don't know if I'm going to go down that road, but I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> um, I'm on day three now. And uh, I've been going to the gym at 530 in the morning. I hate the treadmill, I, but I, you know, you got to move, right? So I do the treadmill, I do the, the bicycle and I do this elliptical thing. And um, so, you know, I, I, I like all kinds of music, right? Um, but when I'm working out on a treadmill, it's monotonous and I hate, you know, it's just like a, you know, it's just monotonous thing. So I want upbeat music, like fast paced music, right? So I've been listening to a band called Budos. B-U-D-O-S. Okay. Budos. The Budos band, it's an American big band. They describe their sound as like, well, they describe it as doom, rock, Afro, soul band with a 70s touch. Okay. It's a big sound. It's a big band, like a lot of horns, a lot of, a lot of instruments, and um, it's, it, it fuses like Afro funk and seventies hard rock and sixty soul music all into one, right? So as I'm as I'm on the treadmill, I put my I listen to Pandora. You know, I don't have to pay Apple Apple Music like you do or iTunes. I get on Pandora and I put it on this station. The problem is, the station recognizes it as big band music. So once in a while. It'll slip in a Frank Sinatra song or a Glenn Miller uh, song, you know, Glenn Miller Orchestra. And, I love uh, that kind of, I, I love that music. Well, Glenn Miller, that's got some good music. That, you're, that's good stuff. I like that stuff. I agree, but here's the thing. It got in my head, right? So I'm listening. So Glenn Miller in the mood comes on. You know, and I, and I, my, my music is loud, right? It's, it's, you know, I like my music loud. And all of a sudden, after going for that, you know, Budos, man, it's cranking, it's fast paced, it's cool. And then Glenn, Glenn Miller comes on in, in the mood, which came out in 1939. Now, the reason why it bugged me, because I'm already weirded out about the silver sneakers thing, right? Now, <laughs> I'm thinking silver sneakers, because it's bugged me for like a, two weeks now. That that now you're listening goes, to the Glenn Miller story. And now Glenn right. Miller is, is, is blaring, and now I'm self-conscious that the dude next to me da, can hear Da, 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 yeah. da, 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 Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah I can see you that. Got it. Just That's it. destroying you. Yeah. So I got my, I got the thing set, I got the treadmill set to rocket ship, right? I mean, I'm blaring. And, and I got, you know, what's the name in the mood? Glenn Miller in the mood comes on and, um, <laughs> It's a combination, man. Then I got oh, self-conscious that other whoa, people could whoa, hear whoa, it. Whoa, 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 back up a second. You set your uh, treadmill to rocket ship, you said? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, in my mind, it rocket ship. But on the actual thing, it says like 3.2 miles an hour, right? But, you know. You're a rocket. It, I get but it. But it's not just about the speed, Rob. These things are the incline, right? So I had that set on like Mount McKinley. So I'm going 3.2 miles an hour, but I got the incline up. So your silver slippers, they... Uh... They got to be like a blur or your silver sneakers. They're, damn, they're on fire. Right? <laughs> so, so, so listen, so here I got the silver sneakers are just blazing, right? 
Silver Slipper. Like Glenn Miller Orchestra playing in, playing in my head so loud people around me can hear it. And at that, at that point, though, you know, now I'm like, I'm into this treadmill for like two and a half, three minutes, and all the kinks are starting to come out, right? You know, the, you know, like the, you know, the little pains are starting to go away. I'm starting to get a little bit of a sweat going. Yes, you're starting to juice up. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm starting yeah. to feel it. And, and, I, and I've, I've read about it, and I've heard about it from other people, and, and, and it's starting to happen. I'm fixing to catch a runner's high. And all of a sudden, this guy, this dude, he's like two treadmills. And I'm watching the game on, on TV. Now, I'm not listening to it because I got my headphones on. But I'm watching the game, you know, uh, as, I'm, as I'm in my groove. And this punk that's two treadmills away from me arbitrarily turns the channel. So it kind of messed up my whole... Uh, How my old whole was this young punk? Oh, probably early 50s. And it reminded me of why I hated gyms and, you know, all these years of going to gyms, man, and that, you know, somebody would be on a cell phone talking or, you know, that kind of crap. So, but I'm getting there, man. It's, you know, I'm saying it's day three. Uh, I even did a few push-ups. I said, I'm not lifting, but I started doing push-ups again. And, uh, you know, so. Feeling yeah. strong again, huh? How's that feel? Yeah, I'm starting feel to feel it. Yeah. Ah, yeah. boy. Yep. Man, you've been sitting around for eight months. You got to do something, man. Yeah, gotta, well, that's the thing. I got no excuses gotta, now because you got to do I say, something. I, I, uh, I, I, you know, you travel and it's hard doing it in hotels and stuff like that, but I'm home now. I got no excuses left. So I, now I got to do something. So I'm happy about that. So, contracts. We hope this helps somebody. Um, or, you know, if you say, listen, and there are people out there say, listen, and I have absolutely 100% talked to good contractors that have been around for 30, 40 years and say, we don't use contracts. I mean, the guy's wow. going to pay me. He's not going to pay me. Um, you know, in this litigious society that we live in, you've got to use contracts now. I have to tell this story, and it would be my last story of this podcast. I think I've told it before, but it's a damn good story, so I'm going to tell it again. All of your stories. No. People, I, I, we love your stories. I was at an NWFA school years ago. I don't know, maybe seven, eight, ten years ago. And, uh, well, actually, it was, uh, take it back. It was, it, well, it was an NWFA school, but it was the inspector school, okay, to be an inspector. So while I was there, there was a guy from Ireland in the school also. And, um, you know, he's got the Irish accent. I love this. Like you said, I love the Irish accent, man. So, yeah, we're talking. After, after the, the class, we're at the bar, we're having a drink, and we're talking about contracts. And he said, you know, in Ireland, we don't sign contracts. It's unheard of. You would never sign a contract in Ireland. I said, really? That's just, you know, a different way of doing business. He said, but I did sign one. Uh, I've only signed one contract in my entire life, and it was with Bono from YouTube. I said, you mean the band, like, you two, like, Sunday Bloody Sunday? He goes, yeah. I said, you worked for him? He goes, yes. I said, that's incredible. So he had to sign a contract. He goes, yeah. He goes, what it was, if Bono came in the house, you could not initiate contact with him. You couldn't talk to him. As a matter of fact, you couldn't even make eye contact with him. It was written in the contract. Don't make eye contact with him, right? And um, he said that we were on the job for maybe a couple of weeks. I mean, you know, and he was never there. He'd never seen him. He was never around. But one day, he was in the room. And I knew he was in the room because you could hear his voice. It's that bona voice, man. We all know that voice, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, he, got, he was talking to the architect or whatever, and he could hear him and everything. He goes, I said, did you see him? He goes, no. He goes, at lunchtime, the three of us got together. He goes, man, he was here. And we talked to each other and he goes, did you see him? No, I didn't look at him. Did you look at, none of them looked at him. They were so weirded out about the contract and everything. So fast forward, he did a concert in Dublin shortly thereafter, okay? And Bono is playing. And at the end of one of the songs, the drummer was just going boom, 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 boom on the, on the drum, right? Well, Bono, you know, Bono, he's the, you know, he's the cock of the walk, man. He's got the microphone up in the air, and he's got the leather jacket on, and he, and he says, every time you hear that drum beat, there's a child in Africa dying. So he says, your man next to me shouts out, well, for God's sake, stop hitting the drum. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I never forgot that story. I can't remember. who I don't know who the guy is, man, but uh, I've, I've told that story a few times, man, because it kills me. So. You know, I've uh, I had to live through something like that where we weren't allowed to look. We were we installed a six lane bowling alley in the recreation compound of the Reverend Sun Young Moon. You know the the Moonies, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The the 
people run around, you know what I mean? We, you were not allowed to look at him or anyone in his family, his wife, kids, anything. You weren't allowed to look at them. So if they were coming out or walking through and, you know, they want to see how the construction was going or they had a guy who would round us all up and shove us in a room and we had to all stand there in this room. But it was nice. You know, you know, my you know fondness what? of coffee and, you know, coffee and donuts and everything. They locked us in this room, but there was nice refreshments in there, coffee. So it was a little coffee break. We all used to laugh like hell because this guy would come running down. As soon as we saw him, we're like, all right, shut it all down. Run into the little room. You, you were not what? allowed to look at him. But I got to tell you, there was a window that I peeked through after they left. And I, I saw him. Hmm. Only from behind. But I definitely saw the guy. I would love to do that. As a matter of fact, next time I have someone working in my house, I'm going to, I'm going to put that in my contract. I'm going to have my wife because I wouldn't have, you know, I couldn't do it myself, but I'm going to have her say, listen, the part of the contract deal, if Wayne comes in, you can't even look at him. Don't, whatever you do, don't talk to him. Don't look at him. Don't make eye contact with him. You know, I, you know that I work security at a bunch of that, you know, I always talk about working security yeah. at that country fest. Um, what's, um, oh man, Trisha Yearwood. Trisha yeah. Yearwood is, she's the, she's the finale. She's the grand sure. finale. Garth Brooks uh, wife. Garth yeah. Brooks wife, right. So I'm working That's state security. Wife. Is it a second wife? Yeah. Okay. They, yeah. So I'm working security and her manager, her road manager or something comes up to me and says, here's the deal. Uh, when Trisha takes the stage, I want all of these people off stage. The only people who's going to be on this stage and allowed to talk to her or do anything is you and I. I want this whole place cleared. After, she's not going to see anybody. She's not going to sign contracts or uh, sign autographs. You know, she's just going on and on and on and on. And I'm thinking, geez, you know, what a kind of a person is this, you know? And I'm going someplace with this story. So she gets all done. She comes walking back. She's walking toward. Oh, that was the other thing is I had to escort her directly to her limousine. They pulled it right up to the stage. And my job was to escort her right to the limousine. So I'm thinking she's going to be a real super jerk, you know, to have all these rules and regulations. There's nobody there. There's, there's nobody there for autographs or anything like that. There's a little girl on crutches standing there with her mother. And the other thing, Walking her from stage to to the limo, she couldn't have been the more the nicest lady in the world. Sweet, beautiful. I, I mean, you know, not at all what I was expecting because this woman was, you know, with all the buildup. She sees people around the car, a couple of people, the crutches. She goes over and talks to the girl on the crutches for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. I was shocked how long they talked. You should have tackled the kid. She signed autographs for everybody. She, and it was like, you know, where's all this coming from? So what I'm saying is with this guy in the Bono thing, you know, I wonder if it was her manager that was making all these rules or, you know, did Bono said, I don't want anybody looking at me because it just didn't seem like Trisha Yearwood would be the kind of person to say that. I'm thinking, is this their management? Is it their manager that comes up with all these, these harebrained things, or is it really the, you know, the talent? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because Trisha Yearwood did not seem like the kind of person that her manager was building it up, building her up to make. You know, she was as sweet as possible. So I still, I'm I still wondering if that Bono thing was just some manager saying, "Don't look at him, don't do this," or did Bono tell him? I don't want anybody looking at me. You know, Listen, don't, don't look at me. If I had a half an ounce of talent, I would say, don't look at me. <laughs> the rules are rules, Rob. Contract is a contract. Wrap it up. Bring it home, baby. Wrap it up. All right. Thank you guys very much. Again, we appreciate your listenership. Hopefully this, some, this helped somebody. Um, um, and if someone wants a contract, uh, you just send me an email uh, and, I'll, and I'll send it off to you. Thank you for listening. And this has been another episode of On the Floor with Wayne and Rob. And please stay tuned for another episode.